本日はジャパンエイジア CCUS フォーラム Thank you very much for your participation to the Japan Asia CCUS Forum 2021. We have a number of housekeeping announcements from the Secretariat. We have our first section and second session starting from 1 30, and we intend to end by 6 30. In this uh, meeting, we have a presentation in、uh, section one and section two. And once the session starts,、uh, the audience is able to send in question using the question function of the Zoom. And you can、uh, send your、uh, the question from the control button. And the, the questions、uh, to each of the sections, please send in the, section,、uh, the questions before the sessions、um, they are concluded. We will not be able to accommodate questions thereafter. We try to、uh, respond to as many questions as possible, but、uh, we will only be able to respond to questions within the time allotted in each of the sections. Today, a simultaneous interpretation will be provided in Japanese and English. If you are participating using Zoom application,、uh, you are able to use the Zoom、uh, simultaneous interpretation function. Please click the earth Mark、uh, on the, the control panel of the Zoom and choose the, the language of your liking.、Uh, you can change the language of your preference midway through as well. At the end of the forum,、uh, we will send an email、uh, with a questionnaire, and your requests and uh, comment um, uh, will be used for the future forums.、Uh, please、um, uh, bear with us until、uh, we will start the, the conference. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for participating in the Japan Asia CCUS Forum 2021. My name is Takashi Kawabata with Japan CCS, and I will be the MC for the opening session, and as well as the、uh, MC for the part one. Okay, to begin this forum,、uh, we will have some words, greeting from,、uh, some words of greeting from Mr. Yuji Sadamitsu,、uh, Director General, Natural Resources and Fuel Department, Agency for Natural Resources and Energy, METI,、uh, the sponsor of this forum. Mr. Sadamitsu, please. Tadaima, go show. As kindly had been introduced, my name is Sada Mitsu. I'm the director of the、uh, Department of Natural Resources and Fuel at the Agency for Natural Resources and Energy. I have the pleasure of saying a few words at the outset of Japan Asia CCUS Forum 2021.、Uh, the challenge of climate change is an issue where all the countries of the world need to urgently address. Uh, Japan has declared、uh, in October last year that we will be going for carbon neutrality in 2050. And in April for this year,、uh, we have put forth as、uh, the new target for, for the globe, for、uh, the, the、um, uh, GHG hit the gas reduction by the fiscal year 2030, 46% reduction as of、uh, fiscal year 2013. But、uh, in order to achieve、uh, the, the Paris Agreement、uh, target,、uh, we need to have、uh, the world as a whole to go、uh, carbon neutral as early as possible. As we recover from the COVID 19, Asia is no exception to where further economic growth is expected. Asia should also go for the green growth and energy transition 
to which Japan is contributing actively. On the other hand, in Japan as well as in whole of Asia, fossil fuels are still important uh, a source of fuel. We need uh, to transition towards decarbonization and we need to support all the available energy sources as well as technology. One key uh, to the technology is CCUS. Uh, Japan uh, believes that the introduction of CCUS uh, is vital in trying to achieve the carbon neutrality for Japan as well as whole of Asia. Uh, we are aiming uh, to commercialize CCUS by the year 2030. In Japan, at Tomakomai City in Hokkaido, as uh, the very first large-scale CCS demonstration project, in November of 2019, we have achieved CO2 injection of 300,000 tons, which was the initial target. Right now, uh, we are con continuously conducting monitoring uh, to ensure safety after the injection. This project is uh, the only one in the world uh, which uh, is uh, located uh, near the urban area. So safe and secure operation uh, needs to be considered in order to gain the understanding of uh, the local community. So by continuing monitoring, uh, we will be able uh, to convey information widely uh, to the local community as well as outside of Japan as to the safety of the project. As for Japan, we had to have a three had the new direction to aim for in order to commercialize CCUS from 2030 and onwards to implement in the society as well as to have a international development. Firstly, carbon recycling, reusing CO2 as resources at Osaki Kamijima in Hiroshima Prefecture, which is a demonstration a project for carbon recycling technology. The CO2 will be used for chemicals, fuel, and the minerals. We will accelerate technological development as this demonstration uh, to achieve implementation in society. At Tomakomai City, we will be promoting uh, to build an in industrial cluster by considering carbon recycling business utilizing the CCS facility. And secondly, uh, we will newly have research and development and demonstration for ship transport of the CO2. Uh, as a leader in the world, in 2024, at the, the Tomakomai CCUS uh, the unit, uh, we will be achieving uh, the liquid CO2 transport by her vessels. In the backdrop of that is, although there are a lot of potential of geological storage capacity on a large scale on the Japan Sea side. On the Pacific side, we have agglomeration of the CO2 emitting facilities. So we need to assume long haul transport of CO2. And for the transport by her vessel, we would like to work with countries such as Norway, which is also considering similar the project to have uh, the technology established as early as possible. Thirdly, we will provide cooperation in Asia for energy transition and also to have uh, a cross-border development of CCUS. Asian region is a major emitter uh, of uh, the, the greenhouse gases as well as having a major storage potential of for CO2. In June this year, we had had the first Asia CCUS network at the forum being held, working with the area. And we had to have launched the Asia CCUS network, which is the academia, government, uh, and uh, the industry international uh, the platform uh, to promote CCUS utilization in Asia. We have the 10 member states of the ASEAN, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the quad of the countries, and also more than 100 uh, businesses and institutions, both in and out of uh, Japan participating. We are holding workshops and other uh, events to disseminate uh, the uh, knowledge. 
we would like to contribute to the utilization of CCUS through the Asia CCUS network going forward. At this forum, I very much hope that there will be active discussion on the CCUS initiatives in Japan as well as overseas, so we will be able to further promote CCUS globally. Lastly, I would like to pray for all the good health and prosperous activities for all the participants. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Sadamitsu, for your warm greetings and showing the actual direction of uh, policy for climate change. Okay, next. Uh, we will have a keynote speech from Mr. Takeshi Soda, uh, Director, Oil and Natural Gas Division, Agency for Natural Resources and, Resources and Energy, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, titled Japan's CCUS Policy. Mr. Soda, please. Thank you for kind introduction. from Oil Gas Division of METI. Due to the recent division of job portfolio in METI, all CCS operations, including both domestic and international, which were previously under the jurisdiction of Global Environmental Affairs Office of METI, have been transferred to my division last month. Therefore, although I am a newcomer in the field of CCUS. I'd like to talk about Japan's CCUS policy, including cooperation for CCUS development in Asia. Next slide, please. As we all know, we are going to have COP26 at Glasgow from the end of this month. Long before that, in October last year, Japan declared our intention to realize carbon neutrality by 2050. In addition, in April of this year, Japan set an ambitious goal of reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 46% in 2030. Next slide, please. According to the IEA report, in order to achieve the two degrees target of the Paris Agreement, CCS is expected to provide about 50% of the cumulative CO2 reduction by 2070. In this context, Japan has also positioned CCS as an indispensable technology to achieve the goal. The sixth strategic energy plan, the draft of which was released in July this year and will hopefully be approved by the cabinet soon is the basic policy for Japan's energy policy. The plan clearly states that in order to achieve carbon neutrality in 2050, the total implementation of CCUS should be approved. It also clearly states that CCUS needs to be introduced by 2030 on the tenet of its commercialization. As discussed at the basic policy subcommittee and the the Governmental Advisory Committee on Energy, if Japan were, to use, well, Japan were to use fossil fired thermal power generation with CCUS to provide about 10% of the electricity generated in 2050, it would be necessary to implement about 100 million tons of CCUS every year. In summary, it can be said that Japan's current goal are to introduce CCS by 2030 on the premise of, of its commercialization and to implement 100 million tons of CCUS per year in 2050. Next slide, please. In order to achieve this goal, we are now working on domestic and international initiatives. First, I'd like to introduce our domestic efforts. In Japan, Four major projects are being promoted. First, the Tomakumai CCS demonstration. Second, liquefied CO2 ship transportation. Number three, CCS R&Ds. And number four, potential site investigation. The third of these CCS R&Ds involves research and development of CO2 storage and monitoring technologies with the aim of improving the safety 
and cost efficiency of future larger scale projects. As for the fourth project, the potential site investigation, we have been evaluating the storage potential mainly using 3D seismic surveys. And so far, we have estimated a total storage potential of 9 billion tons at seven sites in Japan. We are planning to select candidate sites for exploratory drilling in consideration of social acceptability and other factors. Next slide, please. With regard to the number one, the Tomakumai demonstration project, CO2 injection into the aquifer beneath the seafloor started in 2016. And by 2019, the target of injection, a total of 300,000 tons of CO2 was achieved. Since then, the operator has been monitoring CO2 behavior using seismic surveys and monitoring the ocean using marine environmental surveys, which con continues to demonstrate that CCS is a safe and reliable technology. In addition, this year, we launched the liquefied CO2 SIP transportation project as a technology to realize long distance CO2 transportation. In this project, we have developed and demonstrate the technology with a view to applying it in hubs and clusters in Japan and overseas in the future. After the construction of facilities and other preparation, a demonstration test to transfer CO2 from the Maizu power plant in Kyoto to Tomakumai site is scheduled to begin in 2024. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to introduce Japan's international effort. Japan has been promoting both bilateral and multilateral collaboration and Japan is actively driving these two wheels. First, in terms of bilateral collaboration, Japan has been working with Australia and the United States on several collaborative projects related to CCS monitoring technology. That is, we have been conducting technology verifications and knowledge acquisitions at overseas sites in collaboration with CO2-CLC, CCSRO, and University of North Dakota. We also hold regular expert workshops to promote exchanges among engineers and researchers and have discussed further collaboration in the future. Next, I'd like to introduce our bilateral collaboration with Indonesia. Since 2020, a feasibility study for JCM joint credit mechanism has been conducted and the results of the study will be compiled by the end of February, 2022. And after that, CO2 injection is currently expected to be implemented by 2025. Japan has been participating in international organizations such as the Asia CCS Network, SEN CCS US Initiative, CSLF and IAGHG, and also being promoting multilateral collaborating, collaboration activity. Japan will continue our active involvement and collaboration in the future. Next slide, please. Lastly, I'd like to introduce the multilateral collaboration on CCS in Asia. On October 4th, Japan held the Asia Green Growth Partnership Ministerial Meeting, we call AGGPM, to discuss the need to achieve green growth and accelerate various and realistic energy transitions towards global carbon neutrality as early as possible. The meeting was attended by ministers from 20 countries and representatives of three international organizations, AREA, IEA, and ASEAN Secretariat. At the meeting, Former Minister Hajiyama emphasized that Japan will provide a wide range of support based on the Asia Energy Transition Initiative, 
we call AT, to accelerate energy transition in Asia. At the meeting, many participants welcomed Japan's initiatives. Next slide, please. The AT includes a variety of supports to achieve various and realistic energy transition in Asia, as announced in May of this year. As you can see on the slide, there are five pillars for AT. And today, I'd like to mention the fifth item, which is human resource development, knowledge sharing, and rulemaking on decarbonization technology. In this effort, we have positioned the Asia CCUS network to provide support for knowledge sharing and rulemaking to promote the use of CCS in Asia. Next slide, please. One of the reasons why we include the Asia CCS network in AT is the importance and promise of CCS for Asia's energy transition. Actually, IEA's report, which released in this June, describes that in order to achieve the two degrees target of the Paris Agreement, Southeast Asia as a whole needed to capture at least 35 million tons of CO2 by 2030 and 200 million tons by 2050. According to the GCCSI, ASEAN has a large storage potential of more than 19 billion tons. And from the perspective of potential, CCUS is expected to be feasible. As part of our support for energy transition in Asia, Japan will continue to promote CCUS through the Asia CCUS network. Next slide, please. The detail of the Asian CCUS network will be presented by Mr. Kimura of Area later. But to conclude my presentation, Japan would like to strongly support the Asia CCS network together with the member countries and supporting members shown in the slide in order to promote CCUS in Asia. So uh, this is all for today. Thank you for all your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Soda. Uh, I feel it was a very impressive uh, presentation to explain Japan's CCUS policy very, very clearly. Okay, uh, so next, uh, next, Mr. Uehara, uh, Mr. Uehara, Director General, Environment Department, New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, NIDO, will also give a keynote speech. The title is Carbon Recycling and Carbon Dioxide Capture, Utilization and Storage, Introduction of R&D Overview in NIDO. Mr. Wehara, please. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay, so um, thank you very much for having this opportunity today uh, to introduce our recent activity related to CCUS. Uh, my name is Eiji Uehara, uh, Environmental Department, New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, NEDO. Next slide, please. Today, I would like to start with brief introduction of the organization and then I will cover topics listed here, capture, storage, recycling, and other activities. Next slide, please. About NEDO. NEDO is one of five funding agencies in Japan, and we, we are dedicated to energy, environment, and the industrial technology area. Following policy direction from the government, from METI, we fund activities on research, development, and the demonstration phase. Our primary partners are players from industry, research institutes, and academia, with its size from large company, SMEs, and ventures. Technology areas we fund are, as described in this page, energy and the environmental field, uh, we deal hydrogen, PV, 
batteries, clean coal technologies. And in the field of industry, we deal electronics, materials, robots, manufacturing technologies. Next slide, please. My department is in charge of these technology areas from water treatment, next generation refrigerant, recycling materials, and next generation firepower generation, and CCUS technologies. Next slide, please. So let me start with explaining activity on CO2 capturing. As a first step of carbon management, what we need to do is to capture it. On left top, chemical absorption method is already commercialized and used already at EOR, EGR site, or other chemical plants. The cost of collecting CO2 with this method is around 40 US dollar per ton CO2. We need cheaper technologies. There are, in right side, uh, solid absorbent and membrane separation method are considered. Next slide, please. Taking into account this direction of technological development, NEDO is funding projects on these methods. For solid absorbent, we started developing pilot scale testing facility with Kawasaki Heavy Industry and Wright based on our past R&D activities. Using emission gas from actual power plant in order to demonstrate its ability outside laboratory. For membrane separation method, we are going to have an open call shortly to start the project. Uh, this is for your reference. Uh, NEDA is also funding direct air capturing technology, which tries to capture CO2 from atmospheric pressure. Next slide, please. The next phase of capturing, I suppose, uh, I suppose topics in this and next slides will be explained later by my colleagues. So I do not explain in detail. So at Tomakomai port in Hokkaido, we had a demonstration project to store CO2 under the sea. Storing CO2 was successfully managed and now we are monitoring the site, whether it stores CO2 in a secure condition. Next slide, please. In the case of site of CO2 emission and the site of CO2 storing uh, is in separate location, uh, we may bring it, it uh, with pipeline or other ways. Here is the option, transfer it by vessel. We have just started the project this summer. So next slide, please. In next four pages, I would like to introduce an idea and project of carbon recycling. The idea of carbon recycling is to change collected CO2 into something valuable, meaning that reducing CO2, uh, reducing use of new fossil fuel based material and saturating carbon in the product cycle. We believe that this will be a key technology to achieve carbon neutral society in the future. So uh, this is a roadmap of carbon recycling technology indicated by METI last July. In order to enhance research development and demonstration activities, this roadmap shows targets and enables relevant stakeholders to share pathways toward the future. This includes directions of research development and demonstration activities that reduces cost in these product categories. Next slide, please. Here is the list of the project which NEDA is funding now. In chemical area, olefin, methanol, and paraxylene. In fuel area, methanation and liquid synthetic fuel are targeted products. In mineral area, 
There are several approaches for developing technologies, ranging from material development to process technologies. Let me introduce one of these projects. We are trying to demonstrate CO2 methanation technology at Nagaoka, Niigata Prefecture. From 2017 to 2021, a small scale pilot project has been conducted and ended successfully. Following this success, larger scale pilot project will be kicked off shortly. Whose ability to produce methane up to 50 fold. In this project, we will evaluate catalyst durability, study feasibility of future further scale up for future commercial scale plant, and so on. Next slide, please. In addition to this project based approach, NEDO provides place and space for such activities as well. At Osaki Kamishima in Hiroshima Prefecture, we are operating an IGCC demonstration plant in order for higher efficient use of coal resources. Capturing CO2 from this facility, we will provide CO2 for carbon recycling research, development, and demonstration purposes. The site is now under construction and we are going to have another open call shortly. Next slide, please. So uh, this is my last slide. As I described, developing technological aspect is essential for innovation, but for realizing CO2 recycling society, it is inevitable to consider local and regional cooperation, which could enhance effective use of CO2 or energy. NEDO is now supporting four feasibility studies in petrochemical complexes in Japan. Also, spreading idea of carbon recycling itself and sharing updated information on Japanese and foreign activities are important for creating a positive atmosphere in this field. Two weeks ago, METI and NEDO held an international event and it gathered a lot of attention from all over the world. If you are interested in the contents, you can watch the log on the dedicated website. Next slide, please. So NATO, as a funding agency, we would like to support innovations to happen in these technological fields. If you are interested in having discussion with us, I am happy to have such opportunity with you. This is my uh, end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Wehara. Uh, I think this is very, very strong message that NIDO uh, continues to support uh, research and development uh, for the uh, CCUS technologies. Okay. Now, uh, next we will have some greetings from the Global CCU, CCS Institute, which is co-hosting uh, co this forum with Japan CCS company. The speaker is the new CEO of the Institute from October 11th of this year, and a renowned person in the CCS world, and whom I have known personally for many years, uh, Mr. Jara Daniels. After his greetings, he will make a present presentation titled Global Status of CCS 2021. Okay, Jared, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you very much, Kawabata-san. It's, it's great to be with all of you, even though it's past my normal bedtime here in Washington, DC. And it's nice to see good friends, even if it's in a, a virtual sense for me today. So I am honored to be here uh, with you uh, today for this event. Once again, the Global CCS Institute is honored to be partnering with METI and Japan CCS to organize this important event. I'd like to thank METI and NIDO, Japan CCS, and the relevant organizations and people 
uh, for all of your efforts in creating event and thank all of you in the audience, both in Tokyo and remotely around the world for participating in today's conversation. And thank you too for your interest and efforts toward accelerating deployment of CCUS both in Japan and in the rest of Asia. I'd like to particularly acknowledge uh, Mr. Yuki Sadamitsu and Mr. Takashi Soda, uh, who we heard from from Medi, uh, Ms. Uehara from Nido, who we just uh, heard from, and Mr. Nakajima as well from Japan CCS um, for, for being with us today. Your participation adds further importance uh, to the task that lies ahead of all of us working together. As Kawabata-san mentioned, I'm the new CEO of the Global CCS Institute. Prior to my recent appointment, I spent 27 years as an official in the United States Department of Energy. Much of my work there involved international collaboration on CCUS, and in that role, I worked with governments and businesses throughout Asia. I'm excited to now be leading an organization that has presence around the world, including a strong presence in Tokyo, and that has a global perspective and a global mission to advance and accelerate CCS. Each year, the Global CCS Institute publishes its flagship report, the Global Status of CCS. Many of you know that well. This year's report was just launched last week. And although I personally did not have a hand in producing it, I am very proud to say that once again, the report contains insights, facts, and figures, and trends, and stories that reflect, reflect the progress being made in CCUS around the world. So with that as a brief introduction, let me spend a, a few uh, minutes here uh, presenting the highlights of the report for you here today. So uh, again, if we can go to the, the next slide, please. The theme of this report is accelerating CCS to help meet net zero, right? All of the climate math says CCS is critically important. And we've already heard that in the conversation today. Um, on, on the next slide, um, you know, CCS is really a set of technologies that can capture CO2 from almost any large source, including the atmosphere, and permanently and safely store it in the earth. Um, and it, it can help us meet our net zero climate goals while also driving the low carbon economy in a number of ways. CCS is extremely versatile and, you know, maybe it may be applied to uh, emission reductions across energy intensive and emission intensive industries and hard to abate sectors such as steel and cement and, and chemical manufacturing and production. CCS can also enable the production of low carbon hydrogen, which has emerged as an important pathway for emission reduction across industry and the transport sector and a number of other applications as well. CCS can also be retrofit to existing fossil fuel power plants or integrated and incorporated into the design of new highly efficient power plants to provide low carbon dispatchable electricity to help ensure the reliability and the resilience of our stationary power grids. And it can also be combined with bioenergy and waste to energy to remove CO2 from the atmosphere in a variety of schemes. We undoubtedly need a large portfolio of climate technologies and solutions to meet our goals. However, it's the versatility of CCS, the fact that it enables both emission mitigation and atmospheric removal uh, that makes it such a unique and important tool in our climate toolkit. Next slide. So from our, our study in our report, CCS, it's clear, has been gathering momentum over the past four years in response to rising climate ambition and action globally. We've seen on the order of a 30% increase or a 30% growth rate in the number of projects in the pipeline over the last four years. In the first nine months of this year, 2021, the Institute added 71 new CCS facilities to our database of projects, growing the total capacity of projects in the, in the pipeline, including facilities that are currently in operation. Um, and this growth is almost by, by one third, as I mentioned. Today, our database contains 135 CCS facilities across all stages of planning and construction and operation. 27 commercial CCS facilities are currently operating today around the world. Four are in construction and 102 facilities are currently under development. This new growth wave, which started in 2017, has replenished the pipeline 
and can deliver significant additions and additional CO2 capture and storage capacity in the coming years. It's good news for the CCS industry. It's, it's good news for emissions intense industries looking for carbon management solution. And this trend is very good news for climate action. And that's what we're all here about. On the next slide, if we look at the, the numbers, 71 of these new facilities that entered the project pipeline in, in 2021, 41 of them were in North America and 25 were in Europe. And these jurisdictions and, and regions of the world generally have the most progressive investment environments related to CCS, and they remain leaders in CCS development by the numbers. 31 of the 41 new facilities in North America are bioethanol plants that will join the proposed summit network in the United States. This is a great example of multiple relatively small facilities with very low CO2 capture costs accessing common transport and storage infrastructure to reduce CO2 transport and storage costs. The result is a low cost CCS network with a total capacity of almost 8 million tons per annum of CO2. And while the growth in absolute numbers of new projects is impressive, the story behind these numbers is perhaps even more significant as it demonstrates expansion of CCS into new markets that we haven't seen until recently. In 2021, we also witnessed the first commercial CCS facilities commence development in Belgium, in Denmark, Hungary, Indonesia, Italy, Malaysia, Sweden, countries that we didn't talk about before, but now there is uh, concrete action there, which is wonderful to see. And we've also seen the first application of CCS to liquefaction of natural gas, the first commercial direct air capture with storage business announced in Europe, and construction commencing on the world's first commercial application of CCS to cement production. So lots of good positive motion this year to, to be reported and it contained in our, our CCS status report. On the next slide, we can talk about what, what are the drivers of this increased momentum? Clearly the adoption of more ambitious climate targets and increased action in recent years is the fundamental driver uh, for the growth we see in CCS and CCS project interest. Net zero commitments by over 100 countries, subnational governments, cities, I believe over 2,000 large companies now around the world. And the resulting analysis and pathways has reinforced the necessity for CCS. All of the climate math says this is an absolutely critical technology to meet our goals. Governments have reacted by strengthening policies to drive private sector investment in CCS. And the private sectors in many countries have responded seeing a strengthening business case for CCS. And it's, they've responded by advancing new projects and developing new business models to reduce cost and risk overall. This has you know, given rise to networks as a preferred deployment method in many regions and countries now, and the creation of new strategic business partnerships. And I believe there are currently more than 30 CCS networks in development now around the globe. The role of CCS in supporting the production of low carbon hydrogen and in direct carbon removal, both of which are essential to enable net zero, um, is also accelerating investment in CCS. And in fact, of the 71 new CCS facilities added to the pipeline and under development this year, 18 are blue hydrogen production facilities. On the next slide, we can graphically see where these facilities are on a map. And this shows all the commercial CCS facilities in the pipeline. The red dots are operating or in construction, and the blue dots are CCS facilities progressing through uh, design and development studies. And you can see clearly that North America and Europe are leaders in the development. However, as I'll, I'll show and talk about later, activity in other regions is also increasing, and, and there's very positive news in many regions around the world. And you can see all those blue dots in North America and my country, that's really the heartland. And a lot of those are those ethanol facilities um, that look to be connected in, in, a, in a network fashion, which is exciting for us to see here in the United States. If you go to the next slide, if we can look at the, the numbers and the project pipeline in tabular form. And, and these show how all 135 facilities are distributed. North America currently hosts 16 of the 27 operating commercial facilities and has 60 across all stages of development. Europe only has three operating facilities, but a very strong pipeline with 35 in development and lots of good 
recent activity in Europe. And the other regions, you know, in comparison by the numbers are not as advanced yet. However, we expect to see rising numbers over the next couple of years in response to strengthening policies and, and other business drivers. So on the next slide, let's look at the current fleet of CCS projects and facilities that are operating in construction or in development. And this, you can clearly see the versatility of CCS um, on display here with application across multiple industries, including hydrogen and chemicals, and fertilizers, iron and steel, cement, bioethanol, waste to energy, direct air capture, and you know, of course, in the energy sector and LNG production and coal and gas fired electricity generation. So anyone that, that claims that this is still an experimental or unproven technology should look at this chart. At the bottom, there's the dates and the oldest operating facility will turn 50 years old next year. You know, there's a lot of good operational knowledge proving we can do this, we can operate this successfully and safely at scale and at the scale required. It's also interesting to note that as the time passes, CCS is being applied across a broader range of industries with higher capture costs, such as in the electric generation sector or even direct air capture. And I believe this is a direct result of the steady reduction in those capture costs over time through both R&D and learning by doing and the strengthening of business cases for investment in CCS. So if we go to the next slide, I can quickly step through some of the highlights region by region, starting with North America. Uh, put, you know, possibly the most significant development was the U.S. rejoining the Paris Agreement and getting behind ambitious science-based climate targets. Um, clearly, that has uh, been a game changer here in, in my country, in the United States, uh, in our policy approach. And this sends a very strong signal globally to the private and to the private sector here domestically that builds confidence in CCS investments. The United States Congress has also ramped up action. They passed the US Energy Act that provides on the order of $6 billion US to support CCS over the next several years. And there's bills in our Congress that if passed could increase our 45Q tax credit for CO2 storage from its current $35 and $50 per ton up to on an order of $85 per ton. So significant possibilities to extend that here in the United States. My neighbor to the north in Canada has also a proposed tax credit and regulations that would allow CCS to generate credits under Canada's clean fuel standard. And they it's similar to California's low carbon fuel standard for those of you that are familiar with that here. So a lot of positive motion in North America. On the next slide, if we turn to Europe, Norway has confirmed funding and support for its longship uh, CCS network and construction of the first elements have commenced, including the world's first commercial cement CCS facility. In the European Union, the Innovation Fund is expected to be a major source of funding for CCS projects, with several projects having progressed to the final round of the first call, so that's, that's promising. The business case for CCS in Europe is also supported by a strong carbon price and a binding net zero target that creates expectation of even stronger carbon prices in the future, and that can spur investment. The UK has seen much positive motion. The government is advancing its process to support establishment of four CCS networks by 2030 with 1 billion pounds of funding available. And the announcement on the first two clusters happened just yesterday. The high net cluster on the West Coast was announced and uh, there's a cluster on the East Coast as well. And the Scottish cluster, the ACORN uh, project remains in reserve. Um, so much uh, forward progress in the UK. And the Dutch government awarded uh, over 2 billion euros to capture facilities that form part of the Portos CCS network around the Port of Rotterdam. So uh, lots of activity in Europe. Moving on to the next slide and moving on to where many of you are, are perhaps sitting today in, in the Asia Pacific region, you know, a lot of positive motion here to be proud of. The Australian government published its low emission technology statement uh, late last calendar year, identifying CCS as a priority technology. It's since announced $300 million Australian in support for CCS commercialization and CCS networks, and an additional $464 million to support low emission hydrogen hubs, which include blue and green hydrogen production. The Australian government has also enabled CCS projects to create carbon credits and to benefit from its emission reduction fund. China's net zero commitments by 2060 and the commencement of China's emission trading scheme and the inclusion of CCS in China's 14th five-year plan have incentivized 
Chinese state-owned enterprises to investigate CCS where it's relevant. And we hope to see further progress there. And in Japan, you all know this uh, much better than I do. Of course, the Japanese government, working with many of you, continues to implement a very comprehensive research development and demonstration program on CCS and to drive international collaboration. And of particular note is Japan's international collaboration on blue hydrogen. In late 2020, Japan received the first shipment of blue hydrogen from Saudi Arabia, as an example. And I think many of us uh, look at the project with Australia with keen interest. Uh, just Japan has provided strong leadership at the policy level for CCS as well, whether it's through the G7 or G20 over the last several years. This is extremely important and much, much appreciated by the global CCS community. And with Japan's support, as we already heard from our prior speaker, the new Asian CCS network, CCUS network, is also a promising platform to help advance CCS in the region. And the work in hubs and clusters and the CO2 shipping that is being uh, pursued, that is very exciting to see as well with Japan's leadership and activity. Another noteworthy development in the Asia Pacific region in 2021 was the announcement of three CCS projects in Indonesia and Malaysia. And these projects, two of which are in natural gas processing, and one in blue ammonia production, are the first commercial projects in, in the developing Asia. So that's, that's it. nice to see as well. On the next slide, if we go to the uh, the Middle East, the Gulf Cooperation Council states already host 10% of global CCS installed capacity with two facilities capturing CO2 from natural gas processing and one facility capturing CO2 from direct reduction of iron um, in, in, the, in the steel industry. This region has large potential for expansion due to its large geologic storage resources and oil and gas and petrochemical experience and the recognition by nat national governments of the role CCS can play in emission mitigation. And this really is a region that I think we look to to become a, a potential and growing supplier of you know, low carbon hydrogen. And, and clearly there, that's an interest of Japan as well. But Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates all have included CCS in their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. And their national interests are well served by technologies such as CCS that can reduce emissions from the production and use of fossil fuels. I'll note that the Global CCS Institute, we are now opening and plan to open soon an office in Abu Dhabi to service this region, um, given its growing importance. So on the next slide, you know, the CCS story in 2021 has certainly been very positive, especially in these challenging times against the backdrop of expected global economic downturn precipitated by the global pandemic. Action on climate change has grown, and this has accelerated investment and interest in CCS, and that's wonderful to see. But the global response on climate change is still too small to meet our goals. You know, CCS capacity must increase by more than a factor of 100 by the year 2050 to meet climate targets. And as we, we saw on, uh, I believe, uh, Mr. Soda's uh, slides, this will require, according to the IEA analysis, on the order of $1 trillion US of capital investment in CCS facilities over the next 30 years. This is a large number, but it's, it's not beyond what the private sector can do. But mobilizing this capital required in this time frame requires stronger policy to incentivize investment. And that's a role of government. So ultimately, you know, on the next slide here, policy is going to need to provide investors with confidence that they'll receive an appropriate return on their investment over the economic lifetime of that asset. Governments need to deliver strong policies to support action and investment by the private sector. Private companies need to step forward and build and own and operate um, CCS projects at commercial scale. And the financial sector has a role to play too, to help spread financial risk and provide appropriate returns for investors. So we all have roles to play and we all must find ways to work together to accelerate CCS deployment. There are many elements to this, but shown here on this slide is just a high level summary of some government actions um, that can be taken to, to bring private capital to CCS projects and accelerate deployments. Governments could define the role of CCS in meeting their national emission reduction targets explicitly included in their NDCs and communicate this to industry and public that says we want this, governments want this to occur and we'll create policies to, to help support investment and accelerate CCS deployment. Create bankable value on, a, on, on, on storage of CO2 to create a revenue stream for CCS value chains. 
support exploration and appraisals of geologic storage resources in regions where that more work is, is needed there for commercial development. You know, develop transparent laws and, and to regulate CCS so that compliance risk and liability can be understood and effectively mitigated by project developers. There's all kinds of things on here, but I think, you know, finally, if, if all of those other policy tools aren't sufficient, direct grants and concessional finance to get projects over the line into positive financial investment in the early days uh, moving forward, that's an appropriate role for government and a good policy conversation for all of us to have as well. So lots of opportunity. Hopefully I've given you a, a good overview of uh, the activity that we've seen. Again, lots of good positive forward mo momentum. You know, to end on a positive note, all of what you see on the slide here, all of these policy tools and levers are already being done to different extents by different governments around the world, and it's starting to deliver results. We simply need more urgency, and we all need to find ways to work together to accelerate deployment and to help meet our net zero targets. So um, with those, I believe that is the end of my slides. I thank you very much for your attention today. Um, and the opportunity to speak with you. I do hope that once the global health situation improves, I'll have the opportunity uh, to travel again to Japan. And when I do, I'm looking forward to seeing many of you in person again. Uh, but until then, stay well, and I wish all of you a successful forum and set of discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherrod. Even in the midnight at Washington, D.C. Okay, uh, this concludes the opening session and uh, keynote speech. And we will now take a uh, five minutes break. And it's five minutes delay on schedule. So part one will start from 2.30 p.m. as scheduled. See you in five minutes. CCS is a technology that captures CO2, considered to be 